And the question that I would pose and I would challenge you to give serious consideration to during our time together as we look at God's word is this. What is the world's greatest problem? What is the world's greatest problem? We know there are many world uh, problems and many problems in our world. But I want us to consider what is that greatest problem. We look first to Numbers chapter 21, beginning in verse 4. We're picking up in the journey of the Israelites in the wilderness, uh, up and down times for the Israelites, most of the downs of their own making, and uh, we find one of those especially low moments described here in Numbers 21, beginning in verse 4, where we read of the Israelites from Mount Or. They set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone... He would look at the bronze serpent and live. What is the world's greatest problem? Since the first week of March, I've traveled twice to the Ukrainian borders. Scenes of war and war crimes unfolding before our very eyes on the internet where we're able to see wars we've never seen war before, previously witnessed in generations before, only by those soldiers and those who crossed their paths. But now on our phones and, and tablets and laptops, we see it all. And it is unspeakable. It's a problem impacting the entire world. And the travesty is far beyond what could be measured. Yet the daily death toll of the war in Ukraine has by no means surpassed the daily death toll of children murdered in the womb in our own country. Abortion has erased 20% of the generation of millennials and Gen Xers. 40% of those who are African Americans in those generations. How could we even begin to measure the loss, the tragedy of that? Is there a a greater problem in our world today? Knowing that the United States and the number of abortions is not leading the world, but typically falls third in line behind China and Russia. If there is a greater problem, what is it? Is it human trafficking? Is it our culture's psychotic fixation on sexual deviation and so-called gender dysphoria? Is it as the liberal politicians would warn us, climate change? Is that the greatest problem facing our world? What is the greatest problem facing our world today? I believe the greatest problem facing our world today can be communicated in a single word. And that word is lostness. 
lostness. Lostness is the world's greatest problem for it is a problem with eternal consequence. To be separated from God because of sin, to bear the wages of sin, the consequence of sin, not only physical and spiritual death, but eternal separation from God in hell is a problem not only universal to every human being, it's a problem which no other problem in our world rivals. To use the seldom used biblical image, humanity collectively and individually has been snake bit. I hope no one gets under, overly uncomfortable with the mention of snakes. That's because our text today is a snake bite story. But I'm not going to stop with just one snake bite story today. I want to share with you three snake bite stories. Two are from the Bible and one isn't, but all three are true. The first comes here in Numbers 21. But before I comment on this snake bite story, I want to share my own. During a summer break in my middle school years, I attended a wildlife conservation camp in West Tennessee where we spent a week learning about conservation and critters. From a beaver dissection to a meal of rattlesnakes, conservation camp had promised to be filled with memorable experiences, and it did not deliver. All right, it certainly did deliver. It did not fail to deliver. One of the experiences that that uh, topped the others, in fact, two really that 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 surpassed all of the others in that week at camp for me as a teenage boy that summer. Uh, were two things that made Tennessee Conservation Camp legendary. It was the Snake Roundup and the Snake Bite Club. Every camper was given the opportunity to take part in the Snake Roundup, uh, which basically meant you got on a bus and you were uh, uh, taken out to West Tennessee swamps and with a, a flashlight and a sack uh, you waded through the waters to catch water snakes. All of the non-venomous snakes that we managed to capture that night, and there were dozens and dozens of them, we brought back with us to camp. And the next day, uh, those non-venomous snakes were put into pillowcases and paraded throughout the camp. And that was when every camper had the opportunity to become a bona fide member of the Snake Bite Club. It was a simple process, really. Typically, all you had to do was put your hand in the pillowcase and you were signed up immediately. If you were so unfortunate as to reach into a pillowcase full of lazy snakes, not to worry, there was a remedy for that. Uh, just grab one of the snakes and pull it out. If that didn't do the trick... Just give the snake a little slap on the back. And he would typically respond with a toothy slap of his own. Uh, my lazy snake caught me right on the back of my right hand. And now I'm a lifelong member of the Snake Bite Club. Now I have other Snake Bite stories I could share with you, but that is my best. Unfortunately, as we think about the Israelites, one of the infamous stories of their journey in the wilderness is a snake bite story. The snakes they were encountering in Numbers 21 weren't harmless, non-venomous water snakes that the camp counselors were carrying around in pillowcases in Milan, Tennessee. No, these were deadly vipers, the text makes clear. Nevertheless, like those of us who joined the snake bite club in the summer of 83, the Israelites had volunteered to join this club. Well, it wasn't that they exactly wanted to join the snake bite club. It was just that they had willingly and readily conducted themselves in a way that welcomed the judgment of God upon their lives. And this wasn't the first time. They've now been wandering in the wilderness for nearly four decades. They were subjected to that journey, waiting on an entire generation to die. 
because their conduct had repeatedly brought them under God's judgment. Time and time again, since their departure from Egypt, they had rebelled against God, breaking God's expressly stated laws, suffering judgment, pain, even death. The sin of the Israelites had consequences. Of that, there could be no doubt. But that's always the case with sin. Is it not? This time, God's judgment on the Israelites' sin came in the form of venomous snakes. Yet consistent with his character, just as God judged Israel's sin, God also offered grace and forgiveness in the form of a cure. Beginning in verse 7, the people said to Moses, We've sinned, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who is bidden when he sees it shall live. So Moses, verse nine, made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. There was a cure there was a solution for their deadly problem of sin. It was repentance. It was God's pathway of forgiveness and healing provided out of his great mercy and his great love for a people he called his own. Look upon the bronze serpent set upon a pole and you will live. What a snake bite story. Oh, but there's more to this story, and we know there is much more to this story. This snake bite story is a foreshadowing of another snake bite story to come. Even more than a foreshadowing, it is prophetic. For more on that, now our third snake bite story, we turn first not forward in our Bibles, but backwards to Genesis 3. Beginning in verse 13, the scriptures say in Genesis 3, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And then we hear the first gospel. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The gospel is first referenced in Genesis 3.15. Not that there's more than one gospel, but this early reference points us forward to the problem of sin and God's solution for this great problem of lostness. You see, the problem the Israelites were facing in Numbers 21 was not new. It was Eve's problem and Adam's problem. They sinned. It would soon be Cain's problem and later the problem of the earth in Noah's day. It was the problem of the earth in Jeremiah's day and in Isaiah's day and in Ezekiel's day. It has been the problem of humanity every day since the fall. And the fact is, it's a greater problem in our day than ever before. How could we measure the greatness of this problem? Say that it's worse today than ever before, simply when we measure lostness, we see the reality of this. A research team at the IMB reports to me a number every March that's important for us as an organization to understand the gravity, the extent of the world's greatest problem based upon global population, the global death rate, and religious affiliation, they report to me the estimated number of people who die daily apart from Christ. That number for this year 
is estimated to be 157,690. 157,690 people die every single day having given no indication that they have heard and believed the gospel, that they have been born again, that their greatest problem has been solved. They take that problem to the grave with them. And that is why, regardless of the unspeakable travesty unfolding in Ukraine, regardless of the incomprehensible tragedy of abortion or any other problem that you could mention in our world, no problem begins to rival the sheer magnitude of the problem of lostness. That number is not shrinking, it's growing. More people will die lost today than in any day upon which the sun is set in human history. It's the world's greatest problem. Thank God there is a solution to the world's greatest problem, which takes us back to this third snake bite story. The story begins in Genesis 3 with the fall. We pick it up again in John 3. You're familiar with the interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus and the Lord's statement to him that a person must be born again. Picking up in verse 5, Jesus replying again to Nicodemus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has descended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And then we come to verse 14. For Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That whoever believes in him may be forgiven and redeemed, be adopted and saved. Whoever believes in him would have their greatest problem solved by the mercy and the grace of God displayed on the cross of Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. God has solved the world's greatest problem. Shall we not rejoice today that we have experienced that solution, that you and I in Christ have had our greatest problem solved and that we know the solution to the world's greatest problem? That solution determined before the foundations of the world were set in place begins at Golgotha where the Son of Man is lifted up upon the cross and died. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He is the atoning sacrifice of Romans 3, the once for all sacrifice according to Hebrews 10, the better sacrifice according to Hebrews 9. But the story does not end as Genesis 3 references when simply one has his heel bruised and the deadly bite of the serpent of sin is willingly accepted by our Savior on the cross. As we were reminded this past Holy Week, this snake bite story that is the snake bite story of every human being who has ever lived, it ends at a garden tomb 
where the one who died is raised and the head of the serpent is crushed under his heel. Victory is found over death, hell, and the grave. God's solution to the world's greatest problem, the problem of lostness, is the gospel. The story of the death, resurrection, the victory of God in Christ over sin. Any who would with faith look upon the Son of Man who has been lifted up as the bronze servant was lifted up in the wilderness will have eternal life. pillowcase filled with serpents. Thankfully, no one accidentally included a cotton mouth or that story wouldn't have had a happy ending and I wouldn't be here today. An infestation of serpents in Israel's camp. The judgment of God upon a sinful and rebellious people that led to restoration and forgiveness. A serpent slithering into Eden's garden, a fall, judgment, but then a cross, and thank God an empty tomb, a gospel, God's solution. I submit to you today that if we were to simply boil everything about Southwestern Seminary down, to one simple purpose for which the seminary was started and it exists, it would be this. It's to address the world's greatest problem. It's certainly true of the International Mission Board. The IMB exists because 7,000 people groups remain unreached with the good news and 3,000 of those unreached people groups have yet to be engaged we, brothers and sisters, know the solution to their greatest problem. At the IMB, we're sending missionaries to tell them. We're sending college students and seminary students. We're sending uh, seminary graduates and PhDs. We're sending men and women ready to begin their careers and those who are retiring from their careers. The world has a great problem. You know the solution. And so my invitation to you Southwesterner, just come go with us.